Welcome to Geek Court, I'm Judge Nathan, and today we're debating, is the Star Trek Discovery worth subscribing to? Should WB de-emphasize its shared DC universe? And should Danny Elfman use the classic Superman theme song in Justice League? Or is it just lazy? Find out today on Geek Court. Judgment time. Uh, you're welcome, I guess. Members of the jury. Yeah. I've already done see what all the fuss is about. Oh my god, the Scaleri brothers! In favor of conviction. F*** you, Mr. Stark. F*** you, buddy. I am the law! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Geek Court. I am today's Honorable Judge and Executioner, Judge Nathan. Today... We are putting three topics on trial. The new Star Trek TV shows come out the past week and Star Trek Discovery CBS aired the first episode. Is Star Trek Discovery worth subscribing to? Should WB de-emphasize its shared DC universe? And should Danny Elfman use the classic Superman theme in Justice League? Or is it just lazy? Today's defendants for each of these cases, we have James and Steven. How are you guys feeling? Doing all right. Doing all right. Steven, are you ready to defend? Oh, I am so ready. I got my notes here. I'm I'm psyched. On our facts to be checked, we have my favorite bailiff, Aaron. Perfect. <laughs> I love you. And we have a jury of our peers that will be deciding the final verdict. How's the jury? Doing great. Doing awesome. Should the jury be yes. split, my vote counts for one third of the final verdict. The defendants will be judged based on who made the best case and not personal bias. Do you, uh, do you understand, jury? Good. Understood. Yes. Understood. Then we'll start the first case. Now, since CBS has aired the first episode of Star Trek, then expects everyone to pay and subscribe to CBS All Access to watch the rest. Now, I ask you two defendants, is Star Trek Discovery worth subscribing to? Steven. Do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I do not think that CBS All Access is uh, worth subscribing to just to watch Star Trek. I understand that it's gotten very good reviews um, and it's a good show, but uh, you know, having to pay like a hundred dollar membership or even a sixty dollar yearly membership um, just to watch one show um, is just not worth it, especially with all the other options that we have, such as Netflix. Um, rest my case. Good. In uh, only twenty seconds, James, you have your opening statement. First off, uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, Star Trek Discovery was fantastic. It was a breath of fresh air that the Star Trek series needed. And just for that alone, I think we need to show CBS as Star Trek fans, just as fans of sci-fi, that we, this is what we wanted. This is the Star Trek we want. And the best way to do that is to subscribe to CBS All Access. And I mean, I, I, this is the future of television anyway. This is where we're going to go. So why not jump in now? It's going to go to a subscriber basis, like where you subscribe for what you want. So this is how it should happen. I rest my case. Steven, you have a minute rebuttal. Sure. Um, so mainly I think that it's just not worth it because of the fact that we have such other great options. Uh, the one that I specifically wanted to talk about was Netflix, for example. Um, they also have a good amount of their own shows. They've got Daredevil, 86% fresh. Jessica Jones, 92% fresh. Uh, a bunch of like really good movies that are already out. Um, they got TV shows uh, that we see on TV. And they just have so much more variety that right now I don't, I can't justify paying just for Star Trek Discovery, because they have like a few other things on there, but it's just not worth it, in my opinion. And that rests my case. Okay, 30 seconds. James, you have a minute rebuttal? Uh, in response to a point that my opponent brought up earlier, is that it's not $60 a year, because really, if you're only in it for Star Trek Discovery, then you cancel your subscription when the show's over. That's going to run, what, six months, seven months? That's how long you have your subscription for. You don't have to be subscribed for the whole year. That brings it down to 40 bucks for a year. That's not terrible, maybe even less. And again, the reality of the situation is that this is the future that TV is coming to. This is what we've asked for, where we can subscribe to specific channels with specific content for what we want specifically. Sure, you can have Netflix, but it doesn't have to be one or the other. I have Netflix, I have Hulu, I have Amazon Prime. The point is, I want to be able to control what I'm paying for and when I watch it. So CBS charging for their own content, that's not a bad way to go. It's definitely better than what we've got now where you're stuck in subscriber packages with cable companies. So this is, this, is a, this is where it's going. So jump in now and Star Trek is worth it. I rest my case. Steven, your uh, final statement. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I do agree that I do think that this is the future of television. 
And um, I do think that he is right that it would be a little cheaper um, over, you know, to have it only while it's available. But I think that I still don't think that just for like the one show uh, it, it, that it's going to be worth it. I mean, at that point, I think like once it comes out on DVD, which it probably does because all these shows come out on DVD, you'll probably be able to buy it and it'll be cheaper um, just to see that one show. I think that being subscribed to too many things is not really the way to go. I think that um, having like one centralized thing. And that's your time. James, your final um, statement. I'm, I, I, this needs to get fact-checked, but I'm pretty sure Daredevil hasn't come out on DVD. Neither has any of the Netflix original series. So I don't think that's the Objection. case. I, th- yeah? I think, yeah, I think they have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we but I, that's not saying I'm not sure. But regardless of the fact, the on-demand source is going to be CVS All Access. And that's going to be the, the way to watch it. Like You're still spending the money on the DVDs. Regardless of when you spend the money, why not watch it when it's relevant? That's just that that's the waiting that long is just it's for the what ten dollar difference. I don't think that really makes up the price. I really don't. I rest my case. Bailiff. Uh, well, so I cannot find any of the Netflix seasons on uh, DVD, uh, but I, they are coming out eventually. It says they're just making us wait years. Uh, real quick, uh, it's nine ninety nine for no commercials monthly for CBS All Access, but six or five ninety nine with limited commercials, um, and you can watch Young Sheldon on there if you really want. It's new, guys. It's <laughs> probably awesome. Um, and then quickly, just uh, Rotten Tomatoes has uh, Discovery at eighty six percent, and IMDb is at a seven point two. Jury, this is your time to shine. What is the the first verdict of the day? Sign language is the verdict. Um, King John, champion. champion uh, we are Trivia. split. Oh, James, uh, two to one for James. Two to one for James. My real degree. It, it seems it's an argument about convenience, really, what it boils down to. Uh, but I am going to give it to James uh, simply for the fact he made up some points about Hulu, Netflix, and uh, it works for me. <laughs> Case two, WB is said to be planning to de-emphasize the shared universe aspect of its DCEU movies, claiming they will have no instances upon an overall storyline of interconnectivity in the DCEU. So I asked the defendants, should they de-emphasize the shared universe? And James, start us off with your opening statement. Absolutely. They should have de-emphasized it from the beginning and built up to where they are now, not started off out of the gates. DC has been reactionary. DC reacted to uh, Avengers with Justice League, and that didn't go great. DC reacted to Guardians of the Galaxy with Suicide Squad, and that didn't go great. Meanwhile, the one time DC took a step back and worked on a character was Wonder Woman. And in my opinion, that was fantastic. And I think that's a general consensus with a huge portion of the audience as well, at least according to ticket sales. So, I mean, it just proves that they need to work on their characters before working on a universe. The rest of my case. Steven, your opening statement? All right. So um, I think that they shouldn't de-emphasize on it. Um, I actually think that uh, one of the great things about the Marvel Universe, for example, is that it all feels like it's uh, working towards a bigger piece. Um, Wonder Woman is considered the best uh, of the DC movies, but I don't really think that the other movies are bad because of the fact that they're emphasizing or leading towards something. I think that was more of a problem in the directing and the writing and those type of decisions um, versus the the emphasis on the universe is being together. I rest my case. And it's a good case to rest on. Back to you, James, your minute rebuttal. I mean, yes, you can make the argument that it wasn't bad because it was gearing towards a unified universe, but the decisions that was made by directors and writers that ended up in what we have now was in part because of that. What one of the reasons Suicide Squad was so bad aside from the script and the and just and the directing was because the reshoots they did were done to make it more lively in response to what people wanted from a Guardians of the Gar- a Ga- a Galaxy esque movie. Um, so yeah, that that's the whole point is they haven't taken the time to establish these characters. The Batman versus Superman fight in Justice League doesn't matter. Because we don't care. There's, they've given us no reason to care about Superman or Batman. In the comics, that fight happens after they've been friends for 40 years. So it matters. We don't have that buildup. We don't have that investment. That's what we need. Marvel did that first. They gave us... We got to know a lot of the characters. We got to know who Captain America was before we saw him have to deal with Tony Stark. And that's your time. 
Jane, Stephen, your minute rebuttal. Yeah, it's not, it has, doesn't have to do with the interconnectivity of, of the movies. I think you're saying you're right. They should have taken some time to make some movies where it focuses on the characters. But I don't think that they need to basically disconnect like, you know, the movies altogether. I think that they could have had pieces of, you know, of the movie be made to lead up to bigger movies and not necessarily like, you know, rush into it. Like, you're right. They did rush into it. They rushed into Batman versus Superman without making like a full new Batman movie, kind of like establishing that character. And I think that the, you're right. They did rush into it. But that's I don't think that de-emphasizing that, like, you know, connectivity is the answer. I think it's more about like making more movies that focus on specific characters first and then bringing it all together. I rest my case. And you still got time. Uh, James, your closing statement. If I'm understanding correctly, they're not talking about dissolving the connectivity of the movies. They don't want to just make, oh, no, these movies are dead. No, they're just not emphasizing that. They're de-emphasizing the connectivity, which is fine. As far as we're aware, all the solo movies that come out could technically still happen within the same universe. They're just not all going to be a setup for the next thing, which is what we've been given so far. And that's what we need. We need to get to know these characters. And that's what happened with Wonder Woman. We got to know her. We got to know what she was about. We got to know Steve Trevor. And it was awesome. That's your time. Yeah. Steven, your uh, closing statement? Yes. Um, so similarly to, you know, in the Marvel movies, um, all the good, in the, like, you know, single movies that are by themselves, they, they are, you know, introductions to the character. But I do believe that, especially, like, recently, each of those movies is putting a little piece towards like the Avengers, you know, a little piece towards like civil war mm -hmm. and just bringing it all together. And like those movies are like, you know, the movies that have done the best because you know, they've all, they're all connected and they kind of lead up to this one big thing. And I think that that's what they should do without leaving out the interconnectivity and just putting it all together. And that's uh, Bailiff. Do we have any facts to check on this? Yeah. So Wonder Woman is currently sitting at a 92% on rotten with 89% uh, user score. Or audience score at uh, Suicide Squad's at 25% <laughs> with a 61% audience score. But if you look at what they made uh, worldwide, Wonder Woman made $820 million and Suicide Squad made $745 million. Sure. So quality doesn't really matter, I guess, for money. That's it. Well, yeah, there's how many Transformers movies? Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Good to know. And the jury? Uh, we are currently at a split vote for two to Steven and one for James. Two to Steven, one for James. It is. Uh, I've heard a lot of Steven agreeing with James. <laughs> a lot of you're right about this, you're right about that. But you do. Uh, Steven made a great point that they don't uh, have to completely abandon it, and that they are these small little micro pieces of a bigger universe. They are building up to a. Uh, team movie and uh things a big crossover event which is what this genre is all about and i think uh, i'm going to be giving the point to steven case number three danny elfman has just said that he will incorporate john williams classic superman theme into justice league this is a lot of fans thinking why uh so i'm going to ask the two defendants should danny elfman use the classic superman theme in justice league or is it just lazy Steven, why don't you start us off with your opening statement? Sure. All right. So I definitely agree that uh, they should use John Williams' uh, Superman theme uh, in the movie. Um, I think that it is a very nostalgic theme, something that a lot of people uh, relate to Batman, like personally myself, whenever I hear the theme, or sometimes when I even like read Superman, sorry, <laughs> when I read Superman uh, stuff, like I, I think of the theme, it's just like, it's in the back of my head. Like, it's just kind of like, it's built up to be so nostalgic. And I think taking, you know, having that, in the new movies is a way to bring you back and kind of like feel the character a little more. And that's your opening statement. And I feel that James 30 uh, seconds. No, 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 they no, they should not. Uh, one of my biggest, one of a lot of people's biggest problems was how Superman is represented throughout the, uh, the DCEU, which apparently it's not officially called is that he's too dark. And does Danny Elfman really do anything but dark? So right, there's already rumors that it's going to be used in a dark way. That's not what I want from the John Williams, Chris Reeves. Like, I don't want to see that only for it to be used against me. Like so many comic book storylines were in Batman versus Superman. Um, that's not, I, I don't need that part of my childhood ruined like that. Cause that's what they're going to do with it. That's your opening statement. Steven, you need a strong rebuttal for that one. And you got a minute. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that it's important to have like a connection to like, something to bridge the gap between like the characters like 
I feel like it's similar to how Star Wars kind of like keeps like its theme. It kind of like keeps, you know, the idea of Star Wars together. It's like the song. It's something that you can relate to, something that, you know, has been with the genre, the franchise for for a while. And I think like having like the Superman uh, song in there is a good way to do it. Like, yes, he's going to change it a little bit because the movies are a little bit darker. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily like a bad thing. I think we can give him a chance to see how it feels. That's is that your and that'll be my statement. That's your statement, yeah. <laughs> James. You have a minute, uh, a little bit darker, just a little bit, huh? <laughs> um, here's the thing is that they're they're not the same characters. The the Man of Steel Superman, the Justice League Superman, is not the same as Christopher Reeve's Superman, and they shouldn't be bridging that gap because it is a different character, and they need to they need to make that different differentiation. When you try to connect him to Christopher Reeve's Superman, you immediately make that comparison, and in my opinion, that's not a comparison they should make. That's a fault on their side. Um, so it's one of two things they're doing there. There again either taking our nostalgia and using it against us or two it's lazy it's just cashing in on nostalgia it's really that's all it can be here and neither of those is going to benefit superman neither of those is going to help with the superman they've created he's he's he'll, there's rumors he's also using the batman theme which is cool he made that theme batman is dark do it don't darken up let's stop darkening up superman we need to stop i close my statement <laughs> As William Shatner, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Close. My statement. Steven, your final final statement here. 30 seconds. All right. So I think that the the song was very good. Um, The the classic song by John Williams. John Williams is one of the best composers of all time. Personally, you know, a lot of people agree with me. Um, (laughs) He's he's good. Uh, And I think that that, using that... that And I think that using uh, that theme could could be good for the movie just because at, at the very least there's a song or at least a bass for a song that we've all that we know is good um, has a good proven track record um, and I think it's gonna be good. Okay, strong point there, James. Your closing statement here. My opponent's main basis for this seems to be based on the fact that it's got a strong track record and it does, but that's exactly why it shouldn't be used. We don't need to bastardize like the good things from our past to try to resuscitate what DC has put out in front of us. DC should be able to work this out on their own, make this Superman their own like they tried to, and still give us a Superman we want to see. They don't need to cash in on nostalgia. We know that's true. There was nothing nostalgic about Wonder Woman, no real big references to the show, and it still stood on its own. They can do that with Superman. The rest of the case. Time. Bailiff. It was a pretty pretty clean fight, it looked like. Yeah, so one fact is that uh, currently Superman's dead, so why are they using his theme in this movie? I mean, he's not in it. But, <laughs> oh. um, Spoilers. I'm surprised. Bailiff, don't help the defendants. Don't make, <laughs> don't make points for them. <laughs> I'm surprised to report that uh, John Williams is still alive. I thought he was dead. Um, <laughs> good to know. It's good, good to, to know. know. He's 85, but... Uh, he also has uh, composed the score for eight of the top 20 highest grossing films in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Inflated for uh, uh, adjust adjust- for inflation. <laughs> inflated for adjustments. Um, but I do that all the time. <laughs> Danny Elfman is old, too. He's 64, but uh, he, he did Batman, and now he's doing <laughs> Superman as well. So that's it. O- old people making music. I don't know. <laughs> old people make good music. Gabe, you're giving me the, the justice eyes. You got some. We have a unanimous decision for you. Mm-hmm. Well, Steven made some great points. It, it, the original theme does bring you back. It's nostalgic. Star Wars did keep his theme, right? Successful franchise. But we're unanimous for James. They are different Supermans. Supermen? Um, so the theme should the theme should reflect really that. Supermans is this? I like this jury. I, I agree with this jury. Uh, Steven Man, made a great, you made a great point steel? about the track record of the song. You made a great point, but then James hits you with, that's exactly why you shouldn't do it, because you're going to make those comparisons with the new and old Superman. So it goes to James. Now we move on to one of my favorites. No. The <laughs> Speedster Round. No. Just no. I hate each, that thing. Each, well, it's a lot of people say that in this court. Each case will be worth one point. Defendants will blindly defend three cases. This is case number one for the speech surround. Their stance on each case will be randomly drawn from a sorting hat. So you're looking at your answers here. Now, the topic is 
Who is the best comedic relief in a movie? I don't know what you drew, but uh, let's start. James need a, needs a moment to recompose himself. Can you Steven. repeat the question? Sorry, I was. So the question is the paper you have in your hand is going to be the best comedic relief in a movie. Steven. <laughs> I think you're all right here. Give me, give me 30 seconds. Why? Or 10, 20 seconds. This is the speed round. Excuse me. 20 seconds. Why? The character on your in the paper is the best comedic <laughs> relief in a movie. Uh, wait, I got Wade Wilson from Deadpool. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's <laughs> that Deadpool. Um, he's funny. He's he's different. He looks weird. He's got no mouth in the movie. <laughs> um, that's kind of funny, I guess. Yeah. He's gonna. Pete, you're making the jury moan. Yeah, I'm sorry. He's, I'm here to moan. He's just not very mm. funny in that movie. <laughs> okay, that's your that's your time. Good luck, Stephen James. Uh, he so called Jar Jar Binks. Uh, look, <laughs> the reality situation is look, Jar Jar Binks gets a lot of crap, but we may not have liked him. But toy sales prove otherwise. He killed it. Kids loved that character. He might have been stupid, but kids like stupid funny. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you really look back, it was a bad character for the movie, but he was still funny. And he will be continued. That is your opening statement. Uh, Steven, you have 10 seconds for your closing statement here. Um, yeah, so uh, this Deadpool eventually turns into a cool character in a different movie, which could be funny, but... Uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> which, which could be better... Uh, there are people... <laughs> And that's your <laughs> ten, hey, Jar Jar Binks. Seconds. Hey, whoa, whoa. Ten seconds well spent. James, you're... At ten. least Jar Jar Binks was an annoying original character. They didn't ruin anything for us. They just made a crappy character. They ruined Deadpool with, with this version, okay? Yeah, it took a lot for what we got that made it better, okay? And that's your ten. Bailiff. I mean... Pretty much everybody hated Jar Jar Binks as far as Wikipedia is concerned. I don't see any children loving it, but who knows. Um, and uh, Ryan Reynolds says uh, Wade Wilson. I don't have anything on it other than he sucked. So. Yeah. <laughs> Good facts. You had an easy job this round. <laughs> Jury, am I getting a response from the champion? Yes, we are split between two to James. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and one for Steven because I hate Jar Jar Binks. Sorry. We're not personal being biased. Bias. Personal We're not bias. being biased. Oh, right. And Steven I, I, had more he, I am, he is had the more king. Argument. He is the I, James, excuse, excuse James, me, King. James had a better argument. Now in the court of law here, we're not gonna be biased. So yes, James does have the better argument, so we'll give the point to James. Oh, Round no. number two. <laughs> Blade Runner. 2049 oh, no. comes oh. out this week. It has a running time of two hours and 43 what? minutes. You don't even know what we're, we're going to ask. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We're talking about Blade Runner right now. Okay, here we go. Which may be a bit too long for you know, the Blade Runner runtime for some people. So we're asking, what movie are you most likely to fall asleep watching? Oh. <laughs> and Steven started off last time. So James, start us off 20 seconds. <laughs> Uh, uh, Batman versus Superman: Dawn of Justice. Um, I'm not more likely to fall asleep. I did fall asleep. It's not a likelihood situation. Uh, when I wasn't crying from how bad my inner my inner child hurt, I was asleep. So I have empirical evidence that it happened. <laughs> um, beyond that, yeah, it's just too damn long for too damn much ridiculousness. I rest my case. Right on the buzzer, Steven, your 20 <laughs> seconds. All right, so I got uh, Star Wars uh, Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. Um, between the drawn out uh, forced love scenes um, in the fields <laughs> and <laughs> and that secret hiding spot to the boring Senate conversations that they had, I just it was a real snooze fest. Honestly, the movie was very boring. But do you know the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? <laughs> That's time. We'll go back to James for your ten second final statement. Um, I didn't fall asleep. During Attack of the Clones. So uh, I, that, that says something. Uh, <laughs> I mean, really, like, I had to fall asleep in Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice just to not hurt anymore. Um, so that's my closing statement. <laughs> They'll do it. Steven, your 10 seconds closing statement. Um, yeah, I, I think Star Wars Episode Two: uh, Attack of the Clones was the worst Star Wars movie ever. <laughs> it, was, it was very boring and slow and just overall disaster. It, I wish I would have fell asleep watching it. <laughs> and that's his time. Bailiff. 
Uh, all right, so just quickly, the runtime of Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice is three hours and three minutes. It's sitting at a twenty-seven percent on Rotten, so people were awake. Uh, and <laughs> Star Wars: Attack Objection. of the Clones. Isn't that the extended version that's three hours long? Uh, that's just what the runtime okay. says. Uh, Attack of the Clones was two hours and twenty-two minutes, and it's sitting at a sixty-five percent. So who knew? <laughs> who knew? <laughs> Jury. Um, while well, you both made some interesting points. <laughs> Uh, we unanimously give the point to Steven because he gave way more examples and we were able to see where the train of thought went. <laughs> and Steven objected the bailiff, so I like your style, Steven. <laughs> uh, he was right, actually. Uh, I'll come back. It was two hours and 31 minutes in the theater. Oh, you That's just, just what Google said. Fact whenever. checked the fact checker. So we gotta, <laughs> we gotta give well played. Goes to Steven. The final uh, torture, I mean, uh, speed round here. <laughs> Will be, uh, Sony Pictures has fast-tracked a spin-off of its billion-dollar alien franchise, Men in Black, targeting a May 2019 release date. So we want to know who would make the next best <laughs> Men in Black duo. <laughs> and uh, James went last. So Steven, start us off. You have 20 seconds. So I got Olaf and Miss Piggy as the... Olaf from Frozen Miss Piggy from the Muppets as my Men in Black duo. You know, they're both uh, fun, funny characters. So it would definitely, you know, they'd have a lot of synergy in terms of the, you know, the the funniness. And they both sing. Um, so they could, you know, get some musical numbers as they're vanquishing the aliens. So I think that uh, just those things alone are a pretty good movie. And those things alone will be your 20 seconds. James. <laughs> um, mine is Adam Sandler and Tyler Perry as Medea. They could do a lot with just not giving Adam Sandler a specific character to do because then he could do all of them. He could play an alien that's been Adam Sandler this whole time and he gets drafted into the MIB. And then he has to team up with Medea to keep him grounded. I would watch the heck out of that. <laughs> and that's your 20. Steven, you have your 10 second final statement. Um, yeah, so I think that Olaf and Miss Piggy were just, the synergy's just there, you know, they're fun characters and they make like a fun overall movie. It's a, it's a Men in Black movie. It's like, it's a family thing. And I think that it would be pretty fun to watch them in action. Okay. James, your final statement. Unless the movie happens in Alaska, it's going to be pretty short for Olaf. <laughs> he's got that cloud thing. Only when, Objection. we don't know if that works. We don't know if that works when Elsa's not around. We don't know. Meanwhile, they don't depend on cold. They're all they're standalone human beings all by okay. themselves. That's your 10 seconds. <laughs> Bailiff, tell me about this cloud. Tell me about <laughs> Olaf's cloud, cloud please. Uh, what, oh what my can God. we talk about the cloud? Um, I, it, it's like I, can't, a, I can't even figure out what that is. I didn't see that movie, so. What? The cloud um, is definitely Elsa magic. Yeah, but it's like permanent. She yeah. creates a snow cloud for him to stand directly or to stand directly above him so he could fulfill his dream of living in summer without melting. So it's a permanent snow cloud. He would live. Uh, you don't know if it works without her around, though. No, he said a permanent snow cloud. Can you please hammer that gavel? <laughs> uh, this is all right. for the bailiff, for my homies. <laughs> Olaf is played by Josh Gad, uh, who's a comedic actor. He's been in some BS. Uh <laughs> Miss Piggy was originally played by Frank Oz, who's a legend, and is now played by Eric Jacobson, who I have no idea who he is. Uh, I'll give you two stats real quick. Tyler Perry's almost 50, and Adam Sandler's 51. Old people, man. <laughs> the worst. Jury. <laughs> Tell me about uh, how do you feel about We have a 2-1 decision in favor of James, because he gave us that awesome movie idea with Adam Sandler as the alien in Medina, keeping him grounded. <laughs> Based on the argument, uh, I think the your argument, Stephen, is a little a little shaky. Like you're standing on an o a cloud for on Olaf's <laughs> cloud, so I'm gonna have to give it to James. That means James is our winner for today for our proceedings, and that concludes today's proceedings. I'd like to thank our two defendants, James and Stephen. And uh, let me ask you your thoughts. How did you do? Uh, I did great. I won. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it was a good match. I liked it. I, I, humble, I was I, a little surprised. I'm going to fact check that. You did horribly. Steve. <laughs> I, I thought I came in with some points, but I think I, I think he tore me up in a couple of them. Like I think I had a good opening statement, and he just tore me up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Bailiff, it was another perfect day here in That's the courthouse. Wonderful. I love my job. 
Jerry, I want to thank you for fulfilling your civic duties today and the champion for blessing us with his presence. <laughs> and thank Full Moon Creative for letting us shoot here in this courthouse. Speaking of courthouse, you know, this is our 10th show, our 10th case to celebrate the double digits bailiff. We're going to do the next one live at Animate Florida in the Miami Convention Center, the Miami Airport Convention Center. So come down and join us at 3 p.m. in room Mac 1. And this time we're letting you, <laughs> the audience, decide who is the winner. You're going to be our jury. So come on and have some fun this Friday, October 6th at Anime Florida. And make sure to share, subscribe, and leave a comment on what topics you want, you want us to debate and how you thought our defendants did today. I'm today's Geek Court Judge, Judge Nathan. Thanks you for joining us. And courts adjourned.